This is Dr. Herb Bateman in his instruction on the general letters. This is session number 25, 2 Peter 1, verse 16 to chapter 3, verse 18. Battle of the Testimonies. Welcome back uh, as we uh, continue our study in 2 Peter. Uh, this is the um, second um, uh, 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 session uh, for 2 Peter. Um, the last time we, we spoke, we, we spent a, a good deal of time uh, looking at the comparison of Jude and Peter and how they, they are similar and how they contrast each other. Um, and then we, we began our study by looking at the salutation for the book, um, uh, Divine Provision, uh, uh, concerning um, uh, believers and being empowered uh, by God uh, for moral excellence. Today what we want to uh, pick up on, um, and, and we also looked at the purpose, the letter's purpose, um, and uh, essentially to remind believers of their need for moral excellence. Uh, and if, if um, my suggestion is correct, uh, which is um, stemmed largely from um, uh, the influence of Karen Job and her work in Second Peter's. Um, he's he's combating a philosophical mindset uh, that may be similar or has assimilated some of uh, the Epicurean mindset of uh, free living, and um, and so I think uh, that and and then of course some of the teaching um, that uh, surrounds that. So as we think about today, and as we work our way through the rest of this book, um, we're going to first look at um, um, Peter's response about um, eyewitness testimony. Um, and then we're going to look at uh, the false teachers and final judgment, um, assumptions about God's judgment and mercy, portrayal of false teachers. Uh, and denials of the false teachers, and then finally some exhortations to the community uh, of believers. And so this is a, a, a battle of the testimonies, the battle of, of uh, two testimonies, that of the eyewitness testimony and, and that of the false teachers and their teaching and, um, and how that's affecting the way they live. And I did mention this. Uh, when we talked about the theological thrust of Second Peter in interpreting the general letters. Uh, Second Peter's predominant theological theme is a contrastive message of vice versus virtue. And again, with this idea that uh, there's some Epicurean mindset uh, coming in here. And it's, 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 uh, it's done with this intention. Uh, to warn the readers that God will judge all unbelief. Um, so uh, with that in mind, let's go ahead and uh, pick up um, uh, Peter's uh, eyewitness testimony that he talks about in uh, verses 16 to 21 of chapter 1. And as we look at this, um, uh, we're going to see that first he's going to... Um, uh, look at it through uh, the lenses of fact or fiction. Fact or fiction. Verse 16. For we did not follow cleverly concocted fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus, who is the Christ. No, we were eyewitnesses of his grandeur. And so we have here um, uh, a, uh, a, a denial that they're just making um, this up as though they are concocted fables. They just kind of made them and drew it out of, the, out of uh, ex nihilo, out of nothing. Uh, but he is identifying and verifying that what he has spoken about concerning Jesus, the Messiah, and his coming are based upon eyewitness accounts. And verse 17, um, uh, and, I, I, and let, me just, uh, let me just say, so the, the point that, uh, that the Peter is trying to make here is followers of Jesus don't follow cleverly devised fables. Um, the power of Jesus coming again isn't a fable. 
And in contrast to the fable, um, uh, the coming of Jesus has been witnessed to. And so now he's going to proclaim this eyewitness fact, uh, divine eyewitness testimony and scriptural proclamation, attest to the fact that the events of Jesus are not fictional. Let's look at verses 17 to 21. For he received honor and glory from God the Father when, he said, when that voice was conveyed to him by the majestic glory. This is my dear son, in whom I am delighted. Now, he's quoting um, uh, Psalm 2-7, and we've seen this psalm earlier in our discussion of Hebrews uh, chapter 1. And once again, it's a coronation psalm. Uh, I believe that was written by David for Solomon. And it's an affirmation of, um, of uh, God being pleased in Jesus as messianic son. And of course, Peter, I, uh, of course, this same quote, the same uh, event occurred when Jesus was baptized. Um, and we see both, we see in all three gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, this voice coming from heaven saying, you are my son with whom I am delighted. So uh, Peter is testifying to the fact that he heard this voice and now this voice was a testimony from God on high concerning Jesus. And when this voice was conveyed from heaven, we ourselves heard it, for we were with him on the holy mountain. Now, we've moved from a eyewitness testimony from uh, the baptism to a transfiguration uh, situation. Peter is recalling the transfiguration where Peter, James, and John were with Jesus when he was transfigured um, on a mount uh, somewhere in Galilee. So we have first a divine proclamation that God deems Jesus as Messiah uh, during uh, his baptism. Uh, then we have an eyewitness proclamation uh, that's heard and spoken about when they saw Jesus um, uh, as a uh, through his prophetic word, and then we have scripture's proclamation, God's word is a product of God, not man. And, um, and we see this in verses uh, 19 through 21. Moreover, we possess the prophetic word at, as an altogether reliable thing. So there, he's seeing the prophetic word of God as being reliable, and they possess, po possess it, and they share it with great confidence. You will do well to pay attention to this as you would to a light in a murky place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Now this is a very, uh, not the most easiest uh, verse uh, to explain. Um, I think it's uh, helpful to keep in mind that when we talk about an altogether reliable thing, uh, Peter himself uh, is an eyewitness to the transfiguration, which is a precursor to the parousia, the coming of Jesus. And the Gentile uh, believers who were not on the Mount of Transfiguration, uh, nevertheless, have this Old Testament, a holy, reliable authority that also promises the return of, of the Christ. And so he says, pay attention to it. Um, and uh, so they're supposed to be heed to this testimony, eyewitness and scriptural. Then he moves to this idea of a morning star. And uh, first, it seems that the term was normally used to refer to Venus. But the author, of course, has a metaphorical meaning in mind, um, as is obvious from the place where the morning star is to rise in your heart. So he's not talking about literal star of Venus rising in your hearts, metaphorically, it's talking about uh, the star. Um, early Christians saw that uh, uh, passage, or this passage, as a prophecy about Christ's coming. So in this verse, what Peter is doing, he's telling his audience about the coming of Jesus. So obviously, he is combating a perspective about Jesus and his return. And he's trying to reinforce, he's trying to encourage, he's trying to affirm the fact that what you've been taught about the return of Jesus will indeed occur. 
Um, so there's great emphasis laid on the return of Jesus in these verses. For no prophecy was ever born of human impulse. In other words, I'm not making this up. This was something that was revealed to us. Rather, men carried along by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. And this is talking about uh, how prophets uh, have, been, have been speaking on behalf of God through the ages as God moves them. Uh, no prophetic word has ever been uh, of the imagination of an individual, but God moving in them and enabling them to um, transcribe the word of God. Now from here, um, we move to uh, looking at the false teachers themselves. Um, and uh, the first three verses in chapter 2, there is um, um, false teachers are described as being somewhat ubiquitous. They're all over. And then he looks at the activities and the results of these false teachers. So let's, let's look at uh, chapter 2, verse 1. But false teachers arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. So just like in the past, these false teachers arose, they're going to be among you as well. Um, these false teachers will infiltrate your midst with destructive heresies, even to the point of denying the master who bought them. As a result, they will bring swift destruction on themselves. So here we have a reference to false prophets that exist in the past, and they will exist in the future. Um, they always existed uh, amongst God's people, and um, they currently exist within and among the followers of Jesus. And what makes 2 Peter different from Jude at this point is that he explicitly identifies who his opponents are. There is no doubt who his opponents are. They're false teachers. And they're false teachers who will um, infiltrate in your midst with destructive heresies, destructive teachings. Whereas Jude makes no indication that he's dealing with false teaching. What he focuses on is the rebellion that, that God does not like. So you've got two different topics. In 2 Peter, the emphasis is on false teachers and, and the teachings they bring. And Peter's addressing those straightforward, explicitly, straight out. There's no uh, mixed nuancing going on. In Jude, Jude is explicitly dealing with rebellion and how God does not like rebellion. Two different topics because it's written to two different groups of people for two different situations. So we have this, uh, this idea where the false teachers are infiltrating or will infiltrate and affect uh, them uh, through their false teachings, even to the point of denying the master who bought them. And so here it's denying uh, the teachings about Jesus and his um, works. Whereas um, uh, false teachers know about the teachings, and they, uh, and they are denying these teachings of Jesus as master uh, who bought them. Whereas in Jude, they're, just, they're not uh, accepting anything about Jesus as Messiah. Two different situations, two different um, concerns. Um, from here, we look at some of, the act, some of their activities. Uh, we've already mentioned the fact that they, um, they share destructive heresies. And then he moves into verse 2 where he says, and many will follow their debauched lifestyles. Um, so here um, uh, they circulate fictitious teachings about Jesus, but then the results of these teachings um, uh, affect the way they live. The results of uh, these bogus teachings they're circulating about Jesus will uh, first be their uh, destruction, um, they will bring swift destruction. Now, this word for destruction here is um, uh, eternal destruction. It's not physical destruction. It's eternal destruction um, that will be upon them. Paul uses the same word in Philippians as well for eternal destruction. And many will follow their debauched ways. Um, uh, this idea of debauched ways is focusing on the way they live, um, their um, excessive behavior. And then they misrepresent the truth. Um, because of these false teachers, the way of truth will be slandered. 
And this idea of slandering the truth is misrepresenting the truth. Um, it, it, it's like we do, it's like what some might do concerning a person they don't like. They slander a person, they misrepresent the truth about a person in order to, for whatever reason, uh, to advance their own um, selfish desire. Here the idea is false teachers are slandering the truth about Jesus to fit their agenda. Um, we might even say it's motivated by greed in verse 3. And in their greed, they will exploit you with deceptive words. Their condemnation pronounced long ago is, by, is not by sitting idly. Uh, it's not sitting idly by. Their destruction is not asleep. <coughs> so we have this description of false teachers. Um, they, they, they will appear everywhere. Uh, their activities will be um, um, uh, slanderous as far as teaching the truth. They will promote heresies. They're going to affect the way people live uh, for Jesus. Then he's going to move to assumptions about God's judgment. And we see these assumptions in, uh, at the end of verse 3, and they move in through verse 10. Their condemnation pronounced long ago is not sitting by, uh, idly by, uh, their destruction is not asleep. Um, this idea of long ago, uh, we saw similar terminology uh, in Jude, but it's ancient judgment. Uh, in Peter, it's talking about the ancient judgment. Now, um, in Jude, he speci specifies uh, that ancient judgment. Just remember that both Jew and Peter are going to have similar background because they're Jewish. They both grew up in Judea. And they're well aware of these ancient traditions, these ancient Jewish traditions um, that existed in their midst. So Peter is appealing to the same Jewish traditions that Jude does, uh, but Jude specifies a little bit more specifically uh, Enoch 1.9 because he later quotes from Enoch 1.9. But here, he's just talking about um, uh, pronounced long ago uh, as a reference to ancient judgment, uh, which he is well familiar with because of um, his growing up in Judea. Um, he's going to now talk about um, a few examples um, in, um, in this chapter. Um, and the first example he uses is uh, the assumption about sinful angels. Um, sinful celestial beings sinned, they were punished, and they now wait future judgment. For God did not spare the angels who sinned, but threw them into hell, locked them up in chains and utter darkness to be kept for judgment. Um, I think it's for those who want to see this comparison between Jude and 2 Peter, it's interesting. Peter does not mention the Exodus. Um, the first uh, item that he mentions is angels. Once again, a very well-known uh, event uh, in, their, in Jewish tradition, uh, within uh, uh, their oral tradition. And um, Peter may be relying on Jude, but he may not, and may just be relying on oral tradition or some other source for all we know. Uh, but the point to be made here is that sinful lustral beings sinned, they were punished, and he's using this as an example, and they are waiting punishment. Um, and so, uh, and, and they're kept in darkness, that would, that would have been a part of this tradition, that they're not involved in any of the earthly affairs, they don't even know what's happening, but they are being kept until judgment. 2.5, um, he moves to talking about the antediluvian world. This is before the flood. And um, he talks about righteous people. Now, this is, a, this is an event, again, part of Jewish tradition that Peter brings in, and Jude doesn't even mention. Doesn't mention this event at all. Uh, hence, another difference between the two uh, writings. Uh, so in 2.5 we read, And if he did not spare the ancient world, but did protect Noah, a herald of righteousness, along with seven others, 
when God brought a flood on an ungodly world. And if he turned to, oh, uh, so here he's, uh, before I move on to the next one, here he's talking about righteous people who were protected in the uh, ancient world. Uh, and sinful people were punished. Uh, so the, uh, before the flood, people were punished. Uh, but God provided safety for those who were righteous. And uh, so he's making a point here for his uh, readers to know, you sin, you get punished. You sin, you get punished. Angels got punished. People got punished when they sinned. So here, uh, actually, um, um, uh, Peter begins with angelic beings and moves into uh, the, uh, the flood of Noah, so, uh, so heaven to earth, but then even chronologically, uh, uh, angels first, flood, and then he's going to talk about Sodom and Gomorrah. So there's a different chronological order going on here as well in order to get his point across. And we see in verse 6 where the assumption of sinful cities and righteousness is being addressed. And these two sinful cities are, what would you expect? Sodom and Gomorrah. You read in the Old Testament, Sodom and Gomorrah is mentioned all over the place. Uh, Ezekiel mentioned Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, and... Uh, Jesus mentioned Sodom where he says, you know, to the cities of Gorazim and Capernaum, you know, if these things happened in their midst, uh, they would have responded. So Sodom and Gomorrah, again, just part of Jewish tradition, part of that, that, that framework in which Peter is coming from, that same framework that Jude is coming from. And so the point that he's making here is if he turned to ashes the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah when he condemned them to destruction. Now here destruction is physical destruction. Um, having appointed them to serve as an example to future generations of the ungodly. So uh, here, again, just referencing the same, uh, the same story. Uh, and the wording is very similar to that of Jude. Um, but how many different ways can you say this? Once again, is this oral tradition? Or is this a, a source? Maybe Peter is using Jude, but maybe not. Maybe he's using another literary source. Um, we really don't know. Um, so, uh, but here we have uh, a destruction, uh, having appointed them to serve uh, a destruction. Uh, um, Uh, that parallels usages elsewhere. And then he moves to verse 7, and in verse 7, he's talking about how, again, righteous people are protected. And we saw this in Noah's day. We had unrighteous people, but righteous people were protected from the flood. Here we have a reference of Sodom and Gomorrah being destroyed because of sin, but yet righteous people who lived in that city were spared. And who is that righteous person? And if God rescued Lot, a righteous man in anguish over the debauched lifestyle and a lawless men, for while he lived among them day after day, that righteous man was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds he saw and heard. If so, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from their trials and to reserve the righteous for punishment at the day of judgment. Um, uh, especially those uh, who indulge their fleshly desires and who despise authority. So we have um, um, a, um, uh, a um, protection of the righteous, um, uh, even though they find themselves in sinful and debauched situations. Um, um, we see here uh, um, we see that unrighteous um, await judgment. They are sinful people who ignore God's um, um, standards and await future judgment. So now he moves into uh, discussing um, the, a portrayal. He portrays who, 
these false teachers. Um, he, uh, we just looked at um, his um, um, his uh, his um, assumptions about the, uh, about them as sinful people about to face God's judgment. Now he's going to portray them. He's going to betray false teachers. And, and the first picture of false teachers is that they act foolishly um, with boldness. Brazen and insolent, they are not afraid to insult the glorious ones. Now, this also mirrors um, Jude, because we see the same type of language in Jude. And here, here again, um, this could be that Peter is using Jude at this point, uh, because there is a... Um, there is uh, quite a bit of similarity between the two. Yet even angels who are much more powerful do not bring a slanderous judgment against them before the Lord. Now, if Peter is using Jude, he's left out um, Micah, the archangel, um, uh, as a contrast between the foolish, brazen um, uh, activities in, in Jude with regards to Judeans who are revolting against um, Rome, and here false teachers who are brazen in their teaching and the way in which they live. Um, uh, once again, could be paralleling, but two different situations. Brazen in the sense of uh, the way in which they make false decisions uh, with regards to a revolt. Brazen in the which false teachers are, are um, teaching uh, things uh, about Jesus that have effect on celestial beings. Um, yet even angels who are much more powerful do not bring a slanderous judgment against them before the Lord. But these men, like irrational animals, creatures of in instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, do not understand whom they are insulting, and consequently in their destruction, they will be destroyed. So uh, you might say that Peter is talking about their brazen stupidity. Uh, false teachers who are acting foolishly with boldness when they insult angels act instinctively and they live shamelessly. And so you've got false teachers who are bold. You've got boldness demonstrated in the fact they insult angels. They act instinctively. They live shamelessly. And, by, uh, and they do all this by demonstrating um, their foolish uh, behavior as a, a false teacher. Um, so we have uh, an insult to angels, instinctively driven, and shameless living uh, being, uh, um, being described here. So the portrayal of the false teachers is, not, is an unbecoming one. And then he talks about the contamination of these teachers. Um, they contaminate... Uh, the fellowship gatherings of those who follow Jesus in verse 13b. Um, by considering it pleasure to carouse in broad daylight, they are stains and blemishes indulging in their deceitful pleasures when they feast together with you. Now, once again, when we talk about feasting together, um, uh, Jude will use the word love feast, uh, and I, I spoke about this a little bit when we talked about Jude. Um, a lot of times we jump, jump to the conclusion that the agape feast, this love feast, is um, the, uh, some type of um, Lord's Supper uh, or a celebration of the Lord's Supper. But a, a love feast in the ancient Near East didn't get that um, focused or uh, um, hadn't been officially seen as the Lord's Supper at this point. Um, and that's not until later on in the church that the agape feast becomes a, a terminology to speak about the Lord's Supper. But in the ancient Near East during this time, a love feast is a time of, of a potluck dinner. You know, if you want to try to put it in, in uh, 21st century terms, um, it's people getting together in, sh and, uh, in brotherly love and, and, and sisterly love and, and sharing a, a potluck uh, type of dinner. And so people are invited to come to your potlucks. Uh, and, uh, it, and it is a form, in some ways, a form of hospitality in which you, know, you invite people to come in. And what Jude is saying, I mean, what uh, Peter is saying here is uh, 
these potluck dinners, uh, these false teachers are coming and they're, they're staining your, your, your time together because of the way in which they, what they teach and then of course the way in which they live. They're blemishes at your teachers. Um, so they, they contaminate their gatherings. So we begin with a picture of false teachers and he describes them as being quite brazen and also describes them as being uh, con a contamination. Then he moves to describing false teachers as uh, having unquenchable desires. Uh, they're never content uh, and they influence others to join uh, their quest for discontentment. Let's look at verses 14 through 16. Their eyes are full of adultery that do not stop sinning. They entice unstable people. They have trained their hearts for greed, these cursed children. By forsaking the right path, they have gone astray. Why? Because they follow the way of Balaam, the son of Besor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness yet was rebuked for his own transgression, a dumb donkey speaking with a human voice, unstrained the prophet's madness. So we see uh, unquenchable desires being uh, identified. Um, they're enslaved to sin, we might say. False teachers are enslaved to sin in first, uh, verse 14a. Their eyes are deceitful, are full of adultery, they do not stop sinning. They entice unstable people. They are, they are depraved. Um, and they entice others to join them in their sins. Um, um, now, um, they're also described as being examples of greed. Um, in verse 17, um, uh, actually in verses 15 and 16. And, and Balaam is used here. Now here again we've got, we've got some, I have personally, I've got some struggles with, with Balaam. Um, uh, he's a well-known diviner from uh, Thor, located uh, south of uh, Kargamish in Aram. Um, he's remembered in the book of Numbers uh, for his being hired by Balak, king of, uh, of uh, Moab, to curse Israel. Yet God appears to Balaam, um, and he appears to Balaam uh, uh, to not to go and curse Israel. But regardless, he, he went ahead and saddled his donkey and sets out for Moab. Now this is a part of the story that Job doesn't include, that Peter does include. Um, through a chain of supernatural events, a certain irony emerges. Uh, as the historical count unfolds in numbers, Balaam blesses Israel. He was hired to curse, but instead he blesses. Uh, and instead <laughs> curses Moab. Uh, true to God who spoke through him, three of Balaam's articles contain short cryptic prophecies about the coming of a uh, king of Israel. Uh, which is notably positive <clears throat> in many texts outside numbers. Um, uh, his one downfall, which is stated very briefly in Chronicles, concerns um, a, um, a, a, some advice he gave to Moab, uh, to um, Balak, king of Moab, before he left. If you really want to get at the Israelites, um, take your, your finest women and... Um, let, let them entice uh, the men from Israel. They'll marry your women, and then you can turn them from their one, their one true God. Um, but when we look at um, Balaam in Second Temple literature, he is portrayed pretty much the same way that um, um, Peter has portrayed him here. Um, and the emphasis is on his, his greed and his transgression uh, against against God. So, um, uh, so once again, uh, Jude seem, I mean, Second Peter, Peter seems to be drawing more on Jewish tradition, whereas, um, whereas um, 
Jude lumps three people together, um, Cain, Balaam, and Korah, as a way to talk about rebellion. Here, um, Peter is talking about um, Balaam uh, concerning his um, fraudulent teaching and um, very negatively influencing others in a negative manner. Uh, in, uh, um, in his lack of production that ended in, uh, that will end in judgment. These men are worth our waterless springs and mists driven by a storm for whom the utter depths of darkness have been reserved. So, um, uh, Peter does seem to emphasize um, Balaam and his inability to honor God and follow God's direction uh, by bringing and making a dumb donkey talk uh, to him, which of course gets his attention. Um, and so that's an aspect of the Balaam story that, um, that Peter pulls up that uh, Jude um, does not, because Jude's focusing on rebellion, and Balaam uh, in here, uh, Peter, is um, focusing on um, the need to be rebuked um, by a donkey because he refuses to honor God and his expectations. Then he moves to in verse 17 to talk about an un deliverable promise. False teachers promise to deliver much, uh, but won't produce much. Um, these men are waterless springs and mitts driven by a storm for whom the utter depths of darkness have been reserved. For by speaking high sounding but empty words, they are able to entice with fleshly desires and with debauchery people who have just escaped from those who reside in error. So here, um, there's an emphasis in verses 17 and 18 um, to talk about um, the lack of production uh, that ends in judgment and then moves into uh, the, how false teachers negatively influence others. Um, uh, and, 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 and when we look at this, we have this, these men are waterless springs. They don't have anything to offer. And then he gives the reason uh, for their doom, their ultimate judgment. And so the first reason is they're frauds. They're frauds. Uh, the second reason is they're unregenerate. Look at verses 19 and 21 through 21. Although these false teachers promise such people freedom, they themselves are enslaved to immorality. For whatever a person succumbs to, to that he is enslaved. For if after they have escaped the filthy things of the world through the rich knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is the Christ, they again get tangled in them and succumb to them. Their last state has become worse for them than their first. So these are people who have accepted Jesus as a messianic figure, as messianic king, and yet going back and retreating to a former way of life, to a former way of belief. And Peter is condemning that. It's clear that he's talking about false teachers here. For it would, would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it, to turn back from the holy commandment that had been delivered to them. So um, there are two reasons that Peter is given for their doom that he mentions in verse 17. The first is the false teachers influence others negatively. Um, they are fraud. They, they entice people through their speeches and their deceit. Uh, and then uh, promise a great deal of freedom when, uh, when there is none and, uh, and because they get enslaved to corruption. Then he describes these false teachers being unregenerate. Um, uh, they assume to have escaped corruption by believing in Jesus. So they do believe in Jesus. They recognize Jesus. Uh, and the truth about, some truth about Jesus anyhow, uh, but the unregenerate rea reality is they've returned to their previous lifestyle. And in retrospect, uh, 
um, they would have been far better off not knowing Jesus at all. And then he moves to a proverb, um, uh, a false pro false, about false prophets who tend to return to their former ways in verse 22. They are illustrations of this true proverb. A dog returns to its own vomit, and a sow, rather than washing herself, wallows in mire. So these are two um, uh, uh, proverbs that uh, he alludes to. Uh, the first one um, is from Proverbs 26, 11. Uh, but the second one, um, the source of the second one we, is unknown. Uh, and we really don't know where that, that, um, that proverb is coming from. Finally, or as we continue to move on, um, Peter is now going to talk about uh, the denials of these false teachers. What is it exactly these false teachers are denying? Um, so uh, first, uh, Peter's going to begin this section by looking at a reminder. He wants to give them a reminder in the first five verses. And then he's going to look at God's judgment uh, uh, in, in verses 6 through 13. So uh, in here we begin, Dear friends, this, has already, this is already the second letter I have written to you in which I am trying to stir up your pure mind by way of reminder. So, uh, so he's acknowledging it's a second letter. Uh, he calls this, a, notice how he refers to this as a letter. Um, and um, I, I do think that this is a follow-up letter to 1 Peter, and so that makes me, or makes me assume or drum to the conclusion that it's the same group of people in the northern Galatia area. Um, I do reserve the right to be wrong, but at the moment, that's where I'm at. Okay? Um, so this is his second letter, and it's a reminder. It's based upon uh, the or, origin, origin of Peter's reminder. Um, followers of Jesus can expect skeptics to come, and ridicule the coming of Jesus. Look at verses 2 to 5. I want you to recall both the predictions foretold by the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles. And remember, when we studied 1 Peter, he made a big deal about don't be surprised um, uh, concerning abuse that you're going to get. You've been told that you're going to be abused. I mean, to follow the path of Jesus, you're going to have, you're going to have to, you're going to, face mockers and people who do not uh, agree with what you teach and purport to, um, to follow. So I want to, you to recall both the predictions foretold by the holy prophets and the, and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles. Above all, understand this. In the last day, blatant scoffers will come, being propelled by their own evil urges, and saying, where is his promise coming? For ever since our ancestors died, all things have continued as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately suppress this fact that the word of God, uh, that by the word of God, heavens existed long ago and an and in earth was formed out of water and by means of water. So we have the origin of Peter's reminder it comes from the prophets, and it comes from Jesus, and it comes from the apostles. Um, Peter's reminder is to know that people are going to come and ridicule you. The content of this ridicule is going is to be uh, concerning God's promise of Jesus' return. And the basis of this is because um, uh, is that uh, people deliberately suppress God as having spoken at all. They don't accept how he, sp how he spoke things into being in Genesis 1. They're not going to accept how God spoke uh, it through Old Testament prophets. They're not accepting how, G how God spoke through Jesus. They're not accepting how God spoke through the apostles. They are rejecting the fact that God spoke at all. And he's just reminding them that's what we're dealing with when we're talking about false teachers. God's judgment. Divine judgment occurs after God's forbearance ends and comes quickly without warning. Verses 6 through 13. Through these things, 
the world existed at that time was destroyed when it was deluged with water. But by the same word, the, person, uh, the present heavens and earth have been reserved for fire by being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. Um, so here I, 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 I'm a, of the opinion, and again, I'm still working my way through some of these things, but this isn't as though God is going to um, annihilate this present ball that we call earth. But what he's going to do is he's going to purge it with fire. And once that purging is done, um, we will resume residence on this, this terrestrial ball. Um, Hebrews talks about the fact that we will enter a heavenly rest. But then he sees this heavenly Jerusalem coming down and settling on earth. I think that's talking all future consummation of the kingdom's rule on earth and eternal rule um, that, that will, uh, will always be from from the beginning of that consummation for all eternity. So I see that uh, the culmination, the, uh, the consummation of God's reestablishing his kingdom rule on earth is going to occur once the purging of this heaven and earth has taken place, as uh, Peter describes here in 3.7. At that point, a heavenly Jerusalem will settle on this terrestrial ball, and we will, we will resume life on this terrestrial ball in our resurrected bodies. Uh, but what do I know? That's my perception, and we can only imagine, you know? And in some ways, um, there's a part of me that says, let me be surprised. Let me be surprised. Um, but in my in, in my, I got I to gotta say something about the verse. So there you have it. Um, then we move in verse 8, and um, this is where God's future uh, judgment is clarified. Now, dear brothers, do not let this one thing escape your notice, that a single day is like a thousand years with the Lord, and a thousand years are like a single day. The Lord is not slow concerning his promise, as some regard slowness, but is being patient towards you. Why? Because he does not wish for any to perish, but for all to come to know, come to repentance. God established his kingdom, this plan to reestablish his kingdom rule at very, very beginning of uh, the creation of the world. And he patiently has been making promises, three specific promises, Abraham, a Davidic, and New, that has its ultimate fulfillment in Jesus. He's in no hurry. He wants people to enter into his kingdom. He's made it possible for people to enter into his kingdom through Jesus, his appointed messianic son. He's very patient and praise God for that. Because he doesn't want any to perish. But the day of the Lord will come. Um, it's going to come like a thief. And when it comes, the heavens will disappear in a horrific noise and, and the celestial bodies will melt away in a blaze in the earth and every deed done on it will be laid bare. Since all these things are melt away in, his, in this manner, what sort of people must we be conducting yourselves in holiness and godliness while waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God? Why? Because of this day, heavens will be burned up and dissolve, and the celestial bodies will melt away in a blaze. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and new earth, in which righteousness truly resides. And I've already described and described to you how I understand that new heavens and new earth. It's taking this terrestrial ball and um, um, purging it um, for our uh, final um, residence. So we have uh, um, God's judgment. Uh, in verses three to, uh, 6 to 7 in chapter 3. Uh, the future of God's judgment clarified in verses 8 to 9, and then uh, God's judgment described in verses 10 through 13, which we've read. The remainder of this book are exhortation, exhortations. 
And um, let me just read these to you um, as we close out this section on 2 Peter. Therefore, dear friends, since you are waiting for these things, since we are waiting for the return of Jesus, since we are waiting for God's purging of this terrestrial ball, since we're waiting for it, strive to be found at peace without spot or blemish when you come into his presence. And regard the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as also our dear brother Paul wrote to you, according to the wisdom given to him. Speaking of these things in all his letters, some things in his letters are, are hard to understand, uh, um, but recall his scriptures. Recall uh, the rest of scriptures. Therefore, dear friends, since you've been forewarned, be on your guard that you do not get led astray by the error of these unprincipled men and fall from your firm grasp on the truth, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is the Messiah. To him be the honor both now and on that eternal day. Until next time, have a great day. This is Dr. Herb Bateman in his instruction on the general letters. This is session number 25, 2 Peter 1, verse 16 to chapter 3, verse 18. Battle of the Testimonies. Mm -hmm.